Dr. DeMelico. She works uh, in the faculty at Central New Mexico Community College in Albuquerque. She has her PhD in Cultural Anthropology from UC Davis. She is the President and Executive Director of the House Rabbit Society. And for those who are not familiar with that group, the House Rabbit Society is an international organization. I have to be a member, my wife and I are members as well. Uh, who are dedicated to rescuing abandoned rabbits, fostering them, trying to find them homes, also providing information uh, to other folks about rabbits. Uh, she has written numerous uh, books, and uh, I wanted to thank also uh, Barb Cruz from the Valley Humane League for helping have uh, Dr. DeMello come up today. And if you're so inclined, Value mainly to those who use a little extra help on the way out. So, without further ado, let's go. No. Thank you. And welcome back, and welcome. <laughs> so, of. Uh, uh, Two things that I study, um, uh, one is body modification and one is human animal studies. Did the human animal studies just a couple of minutes ago and now I just thought I would talk a little about body modification. I thought I'd start with an introduction, what it is, how it's used, some of the functions and then get into in particular how gender plays a role in um, um, body modification. So. So, just as an introduction, humans have been adorning and modifying our bodies since we first became human. All societies everywhere physically alter bodies in an attempt to meet cultural standards of beauty as well as religious and social obligations. Um, it is one of the oldest forms of um, both art as well as um, uh, one of the oldest signs of social interaction because we actually mark uh, social identity and um, interaction as well as social status on our bodies. In addition, people modify and adorn their bodies as part of the complex process of creating and recreating their personal and social identities. So we start with temporary body modification uh, or body adornment. There's body modification, body adornment, uh, and there's the overlap in between those. So we can physically enhance the body temporarily through practices such as henna, uh, common in um, um, South Asia and the Middle East. Um, we can also temporarily modify our bodies or adorn our bodies, I should say, uh, through the use of makeup, um, body paint, um, hairstyle. And then once we get into things like piercing, we're moving from the temporary into the permanent, depending on sort of how you define it. Um, And then there's permanent. Obviously, permanent body modification is going to have different functions uh, than temporary. So we have scarification here on the left. We have tattooing here on the right. Um, it includes everything from surgery, tattooing, scarification, implants, cutting, uh, and encumberments. Encumberments is where you will physically encumber the body by hanging things off of the body or by constricting the body. We'll talk more about that. Body painting has probably been practiced since the Paleolithic, as archaeological evidence indicates. There's actually some um, remains of late Paleolithic humans in which the, um, uh, after the, um, the body has decomposed, a little bit of the paint actually remained on what was left of the skin so that we can see it's a very ancient practice. Tattoos on mummies and piercings and incisions on statues provide some of the earliest evidence that humans have long practiced a wide range of body modification. Um, again, ancient and completely cross-cultural and universal. Adornments such as jewelry have been found in the earliest human graves and bodies on earth from 5,000 years ago show signs of intentional head shaping. This head is actually both shaped and it's also been subject to trepanation, which is an early form of surgery where you cut a hole into the skull uh, and people actually did that and lived through it. Um, it's clear that adorning and modifying the body is a central human practice. What I want to argue is, is that it's what 
in part makes us human. Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. These are encumberments. You have the Chinese foot binding here on the left. You have what people call neck stretching. The neck is not actually stretched. Uh, the coils are worn and they, after years, uh, the weight will push the, um, the clavicles down a little bit, but the neck is not actually stretched. Um, and this is uh, a woman from Burma. The corsets, of course, we're more familiar with in Western culture, but it's the same practice of um, physically constricting the body, uh, in this case for aesthetic reasons. You have the ear and lip stretching, both in this case, um, which is done through by cutting into the lips and cutting into the ears and then putting um, a larger and larger and larger discs inside the hole so that it stretches. And then scarring and cutting. Scarification is sort of the African analogous practice to tattooing. Uh, it serves some of the same functions as tattooing. Um, it tends to be used in cultures where skin is much darker. Um, this is cutting. This is a contemporary practice in which uh, it's um, similar to scarification that you cut the skin, but here you actually cut the skin and cut pieces out of the skin uh, to create a permanent design. Right, yeah, it, it just scars up, so you have an indented, light-colored scar, yeah. And then again, tattooing, which is what I want to focus on uh, uh, primarily today. Uh, this is the Samoan Paya Polynesia, um, um, has just exemplary um, tattoo styles. Uh, this is an atile facial tattoo from China. Um, both very common practices, the lower male tattoo found uh, on male bodies. Um, these are primarily facial tattoos are mostly seen on women. And then surgery, of course. We think of surgery in the West as primarily a medical practice, but it also is done for aesthetic reasons. Uh, this is elective amputation. Um, um, uh, psychologists consider people who do this as having a form of body uh, dysmorphic disorder uh, where they um, feel like their body is wrong because they have that extra limb or that extra digit. Um, usually what you find is fingers and toes are cut off um, just simply because most people don't really have what it takes to cut off a whole arm um, on their own. Um, and then of course cosmetic surgery, which of course is a contemporary practice today in the West and the East. Piercing, shaping, and implants. Uh, here we have a stretched uh, earlobe. Um, here we have an implant. These are silicon implants. Uh, they're surgically implanted under the skin um, to create a design. I have a question. Mm -hmm. In this condo, it looks like that her earlobe might have been modified. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so she's got the Spock ear, which is a really common um, modification there, or the elf ear, uh, if you will. Yeah. Yep, these ones are, um, that one and this one are both trickier in the United States because in most places it is illegal um, to do surgical practices without a medical license. Um, and so you're gonna do them um, on your own. You're gonna have, there are some piercers who specialize in this kind of thing, but it's, um, again, usually not on the right side of the law. And on that implant, what is that? It's a star. And it's made out of what kind of Silicon, yep. Yeah. Yeah, you typically see those. In fact, if, if I'd finished my last talk, I had some slides of um, people who are turning themselves into animals. And so you typically see those as horns, you know, um, on the head for people who are trying to look like other, you know, animals. Okay, today, tattooing, scarification, piercing, body painting, and other forms of permanent and temporary Body modification are found in every culture around the world and are seen as visible markers of gender, age, social status, family position, tribal affiliation, and other social features. I mean, the, the, one of the things that we note with these kinds of practices is that they are about marking the co cultural and the social on the body. But even without these explicit markers, the tattoos and the piercings and whatnot, we always mark culture on the body. And that's part of what I wanna emphasize today is that by um, demanding that women are a certain weight or that demanding that men have a certain level of musculature that is a way in which we um, put cultural um, um, norms 
into and onto the body. Um, so tattoos are just a very visible way in which we do that, but we do that all the time, uh, regardless of what we're talking about. So again, they are uh, a central way in which we create, communicate, and maintain status and identity. Um, these are Japanese men with the traditional Japanese bodysuit, especially the one in the front who has a complete bodysuit. Um, um, this is intended to be worn with an open kimono in a bathhouse, and that is the river uh, that is untattooed. And that is the only place that's untattooed is going down the river. Now traditionally in Japan, these are worn by the Yakuza, which is the Japanese mafia and other members of the underclass. Um, and it's, again, a very visible way in which their status as underclass um, and, and as marginalized and oppositional members of society was um, displayed to others. And even today, um, tattooing is still seen kind of rough uh, among um, mainstream members of Japanese society. The, it's going to show how long you've been getting tattooed because obviously you're not going to get it all at once for sure. Um, you know, with, with men's tattoos in particular, what we see too is that the more extensive the, to, the tattoo, the more um, a visible demonstration of his prowess and his heroism and his, you know, bravery and all that kind of stuff, which is interesting because as, as I'll talk about, that's not how women are measured. So in terms of why humans do this, uh, what I'm arguing and what other people have argued before me is that this uh, uh, body modification is the visible way in which we imprint culture on our bodies, in which we literally make ourselves human. And what I wanted to say last time, uh, but I sort of ran out of time, was it's a way in which we separate ourselves from the non-human world, from the animal world. So the idea is even though, I just argued uh, you know, an hour ago that um, since um, animals have brought in, been brought into human cultural worlds, we spend all of our time modifying them to meet our needs. At the same time, we still seem to see them as somehow uncultured and unmarked, um, even though, again, we physically mark them all the time. But for humans, if we're naked, if we're unmarked, then that makes us animals. And so when we do things to ourselves, we uh, separate ourselves from the animal world. We go from, in uh, Levi Strauss's words, uh, we go from raw to cooked. Um, a raw human is not really a human at all. What we're trying to do is cook, become cooked. So for instance, we've always had a fear. Humans, especially again as we move into state level societies, um, um, humans have had a fear of, of being like animals, being compared to animals, being seen as animals, having any kind of a comparison to animals. That's one reason why evolutionary theory uh, was and still is so threatening um, to humans. So for instance, uh, let me see if I can move that little thing here. The discovery of African apes by Europeans was an example of how unsettling it was for humans to see animals who so clearly challenge the human-animal border. Uh, the reason that, animal, that gorillas are called gorillas is because the first European who saw a gorilla thought that they were a hairy, ugly uh, tribe of women. Um, and that's the name that he gave to this ugly tribe of women. Um, and again, very, very threatening. Um, Many cultures believe that one is not fully human if the body is not properly adorned or modified. Even the wearing of makeup and the styling of hair are ways that humans separate themselves from non-humans. Um, you know, everything from laws against bestiality to um, our I think um, a lot of the current opposition to animal rights philosophy today has to do with the threat that people have of animals becoming too close to us, of animals becoming too much like us, or us becoming too much like them. Um, so this impulse to separate ourselves out from them is one of the things I think that, that um, body modification stems from. The modification of the body is the simplest means by which human beings are turned into social beings. The more altered the body, the more human and civilized. The less altered the body, the more animalistic um, the body. This is Photoshop. This is not a real person. So going back to that distinction between temporary and, um, and 
permanent. I also want to break it down between traditional societies, which I'm just defining in the simplest sense here, to talk about um, band level societies, hunters and gatherers, tribal societies like pastoralists and horticulturalists, um, um, small scale farming societies, um, everything up to state level societies is what I'm calling traditional societies, pre-capitalist, pre-industrial societies. In these kinds of societies, the marking of the body was a sign of inclusion in the community. Now, this is such an important difference that we're going to see to when the state emerges, that here we marked inclusion into the community. The type of uh, mark that you wore represented marital status, represented tribal status, represented uh, one's accomplishments uh, within the tribe. It was about being incorporated into the community as a member. Temporary markings are often used in a ritual context to make the individual different and extraordinary and is often used to celebrate or mark a specific cultural or ritual event. So henna uh, has traditionally been used for brides um, the night before the wedding, um, again, to celebrate this important event. Um, body painting is used, I, I don't think I have a slide on that. Yeah, so body painting would be used to, this by the way, body painting is typically the one exception to the separate yourself out from animal rule because often you use body painting to make yourself seem like a fierce animal during warfare, but that's the only time that you'll actually try to do that. Um, Still sticking with traditional societies as we move into permanent marks. This is the head shaping here. Um, permanent marks are generally used to mark a permanent status onto the body, such as adulthood, class, caste, or marriageability. Um, so you're typically going to start getting these things. I mean, the head shaping begins early, but with the tattoos and the piercings and the stretchings and whatnot, that typically begins um, at at around puberty um, because you're marking for the girls marriageability for the boys adult status. Then we move into the state. With the state, we start to see um, um, the external control over the human body. We start to see the state control over its citizens' bodies. So with the development of agriculture and the state, and if you were here from my last talk, we talked about the domestication of animals as being that sort of key moment um, um, when we begin to control the bodies of animals. Well, it's the same thing with people. As we begin to turn animals into property, and as those animals are used to generate wealth and a surplus of wealth, we begin to see um, non-producing classes, um, elites, slaves, all the different levels of stratification that emerge with the state. And with the underclasses, it involves the control over those bodies, slave bodies, servant bodies, convict bodies. With the elites, there's a different kind of control that we see that's usually exercised over women's bodies to maintain class boundaries. Um, so with the development of agriculture and the state, markings like tattooing, scarring, and branding became signs of exclusion, control, and stig stigmatization. So rather than showing that this slave is marked as a, to show that he's a member of the community, instead it shows that he's a um, piece of property. Um, you might be branded um, differently after you've escaped, become an escaped slave, and then you're going to have a different mark. So it shows again that you are state property or private property or um, trouble, a troubled body, essentially. Um, um, the term uh, stigma uh, that we use for the, you know, people who are stigmatized, the term stigma actually means tattoo um, in Latin, and it refers to the marks that the early Christians got. The Christians were, um, um, in the early days before Constantine uh, converted to Christianity, um, the Christians were a criminal group, um, and they were tattooed as such and sent to the mines. Um, as punishment and were typically tattooed on their head and that was the stigma that they wore. Um, okay. So tattoos became marks of ownership and control rather than an inclusion and identity. So again, tattoos and brands were used to mark slave or criminal status. And this is, again, started with the ancient civilizations and has gone up uh, to um, 
you know, a couple hundred years ago when um, slavery in the West was still happening, leading to the use of tattoos among prisoners to today. Um, most Western cultures and now some Eastern cultures do this, where, where the tattoos began as a way to mark criminal status. And they were typically done on the face or they were done on the hand, uh, someplace where the convict after he was released would be visibly, uh, visibly demonstrate his convict status wherever he wanted. It began probably that some convicts began to self-mark themselves either as a way to hide the tattoo because if you had a, you know, a, um, a letter, uh, a Greek or a Roman letter that said you were a thief on your forehead, you might turn that into a bird or something like that. I mean, it still is going to look strange, but at least it didn't say thief or robber on your head. So that was one thing that they probably started to do. And then another thing was prisoners probably started to take the mark of their subordination and turn it back against the state by self-marking themselves. For instance, when um, Australia was a penal colony for England, as the convicts were being transported from um, England to Australia on the ship on the way over, um, they would tattoo themselves and they would tattoo themselves as a way to erase the marks that they already got back in England and to change their identity so that once they got to the other shore, nobody knew who they were anymore. Um, at any rate, tattoos are still used today in prison. They are illegal in prison um, because the prison in a sense still needs control over their bodies and doesn't want them taking control over their bodies that way. They're also visible signs of their imprisonment. The types of tattoos they get, the iconography, the placement of that tattoos. We still have facial tattoos with respect to prisoners. The tear uh, coming down from the eye is one of the most classic signs. We still have um, hand tattoos and neck tattoos, very visible tattoos that very visibly demonstrate their permanent status as a convict. But so that tear just means it's been it means a number of things. Some people use it to represent the number of people they've killed, the number of tears you have. Sometimes it's the number of times you've been in, inside. Um, when well, I those are two like major di different things. Like whether you yeah, yeah. Or yeah, yeah. Murder. yeah. So it's like when you see somebody with those with a tear, yeah. It's like Either way, you should probably maybe you know not bring them home to dad or something. <laughs> I would say. Um, <laughs> Um, when I was doing my research and interviewing um, convict tattooists, they told me that there was a, um, essentially there's a code of honor, which is to say um, that you don't, the, it's the difference between a convict and an inmate. An inmate's just somebody who's in prison for whatever reason and he's going to be out of prison. A convict is, if not a technical lifer, somebody who's in the life and somebody who's in the game and, you know, is probably not going to be out of the game. And so the tattooist would not tattoo inmates. You wouldn't tattoo a young guy. You wouldn't tattoo somebody who's never been tattooed before. You wouldn't tattoo somebody who's just going to be in and out and is going to have some sort of a legitimate life afterwards. So they know that this is a permanent mark of identity that's going to permanently mark them as a member of the underclass. Um, by the way, which is why there's a thriving um, nonprofit business in um, eliminating gang and prison tattoos, you know, in almost every community that has a um, large population of gang members so that they can have some sort of a life again afterwards. These marks are still used in modern times. This is um, um, the, the common mark that was used in the Auschwitz complex uh, uh, during the Holocaust. It was originally used to mark the political prisoners, was later used to mark the Jews. Um, um, this is, uh, you know, the Holocaust survivors, those that are still alive today, um, some still have these tattoos. Now, you may know that um, tattooing is, um, according to how you read the Old Testament, tattooing is prohibited in the Old Testament. Um, um, this is another reason why, for a lot of Jews, tattoos are quite problematic because of these Holocaust tattoos. This is an Armenian woman who was tattooed by the Turks under the Turkish, Turkish occupation. Um, and that was another sort of way in which tattoos were used to control people, in this case, women. Um, also the state. The other thing that was started to arise with the state was the use of body adornment um, and body modification uh, by the elites to separate themselves out from the poor. So as we start to get class stratification in these early uh, ancient civilizations, 
one of the ways that the classes were demarcated was by the physical modifications of the body, or again, even by adornments, by the fact that only elites could wear certain kinds of wigs, for instance, uh, or only elites could wear certain kinds of makeup. Um, um, sumptuary laws are laws that prohibit uh, the poor from wearing the kinds of fabric or furs or, um, again, makeup that, that the rich wear as a way to make sure that the classes are physically separated out. Um, Now I want to focus on gendered markings. So those were just some general statements to make about the function of body modification in traditional and uh, state level societies. And now we want to see how gender plays a role. So the first thing I want to say, and this to me is the point that kind of sums the whole thing up, is um, this is a quote that I took from somebody some years ago. I don't even know where I got it anymore, but I love it. Men are defined by and valued for what they do and what they have achieved. Women are defined by how they look and by their reproductive abilities. I think I changed that quote a little bit, but you see what I'm saying. Men are defined by what they do. Women are defined by how they look. And that, to me, goes to the crux of how uh, body modification works um, with respect to men and women. Now, test of masculinity. Well, the, the, the thing that um, I notice, and that obviously other people have noticed, is that cultures in which men have initiation tests that are specific to men, that women don't have parallels of, and that's most cultures. There's uh, not that many um, 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 initiation rituals for women, and those that exist um, are about something different. Um, um, so for instance, a, a quinceanera or something like that for a woman or a woman's debutante party um, is about celebrating her femininity, her beauty, maybe her marriageability, her coming of age, whereas men's tests are about their accomplishments and men's tests are about do they have what it takes to be a man. And the idea here is in a lot of cultures, um, men are made but women are born. A man, has to be, a man has to be made. A man has to be turned into a man, and not every man gets to be a man. So manhood is um, highly valued, um, and it is embattled then, because not every man gets to have it. And men can have their manhood challenge, and men do have their manhood challenge. Um, so these tests of masculinity that I want to talk about are about male dominance and about um, a boy demonstrating that he has what it takes to become an adult male with all the rights and responsibilities of that in society. Um, so again, masculinity is valued, but masculinity is hard to get, hard to achieve, and hard to keep. Thus, um, you know, the term faggot, for instance, in contemporary society, especially among kids, among boys, aimed at other boys as a way to police their masculinity and as a way to make sure that they stay within the bounds of what is acceptable normative masculinity. So tests of masculinity. often involve body modification. In particular, you've got scarification, tattooing, and circumcision are the three major forms of body modification that are used as parts of male um, initiation rituals. So men's tattoos, circumcisions, scars, or piercings signify an achievement, as is masculinity in general. Because so many of these practices are painful, they also serve as a test of a man's strength and courage, which demonstrates his fitness as a man. Again, manhood has to be earned. A woman's marks, almost without exclusion, there are some exceptions, um, make her marriageable. Now, what are the practices that men undergo? Um, obviously, again, what we just mentioned, tattooing, scarification, all of that. But I want to focus just for a second on the genital um, things, the genital tests. Men alone undergo circumcision, subincision, and castration. Uh, circumcision, of course, is the removal of the foreskin. Subincision is, this was done in um, Africa as well as some other cultures, in which the penis is um, sliced down its, um, down the shaft and essentially opened up and allowed to heal uh, open, obviously with no anesthesia, obviously without surgical equipment. Um, I can't imagine the pain, um, although it was said that um, sex would be more pleasurable afterwards because the urethra is exposed, and I guess it's quite sensitive. And so, you know, intercourse, I guess, is better. At any rate, so circumcision, subincision, of course, castration is the removal of the testicles. 
Circumcision and subincision are important ritual activities that allow a boy to become a man, or in the case of Judaism, that Mark I is a member of the tribe of Jews. Judaism is the one exception to the rule that um, boys become circumcised at adolescence to let them into adulthood. Uh, for Judaism, it's different. Um, and that, at the same time, test his strength and endurance, both important characteristics expected of men. So if you are a boy and you are undergoing one of these uh, rituals, you do not cry, you do not scream, you are stoic, you are strong, you are masculine. Castration, on the other hand, is a punitive measure, but does not punish a person because he is a man, but because he is a criminal, a slave, or a prisoner of war. So castration, of course, has also been used since the earliest days of animal domestication. Again, some of those same practices that were used to control animals were used to control problematic people and to control people who are going to be in a subservient position, uh, like servants. Um, so castration is punishment, but it's not punishment because you're a man, although obviously it targets that sort of essence of masculinity. The other practices um, are extremely painful, but they celebrate manhood and masculinity and also leave his um, um, sexual um, um, apparatus um, functioning, functioning, and well functioning again if you believe the thing about the uh, sub subincision making sex better. Female body modification, again, I'm focusing now on female body modification within um, rituals, uh, within rituals. So if most initiation rituals are aimed at men in order to prepare them for manhood and to test their masculinity, the primary female body modification ritual is female genital mutilation, what some people call female circumcision, but it is not circumcision. If circumcision is the removal of the foreskin, then technically female circumcision, and this is practiced in some places, would be the removal of the hood over the clitoris, which would leave the clitoris intact. What female genital modification is, is the removal of the clitoris. Um, obviously, a totally different ritual, or totally different practice, I should say, with totally different results, because the result is no more sexual functioning. Um, and some uh, practices uh, uh, don't just include the, the female genital, the, the clitoridectomy, the removal of the clitoris, but infibulation, which is the practice then of um, usually you will cut off the, I forget whether it's the um, inner or the outer labia. You cut off one of the sets of labia and then you sew them together. Um, and then in some cultures, then you know it heals eventually at closed. Um, you just make sure that there's a little opening for urination. And then in some cultures, the night before the wedding, the husband's mother will cut her open um, so that, of course, you know she can have sex. Sometimes then you have recircumcision where you cut her open so that she can have sex, but then after she has her baby, she's, she's sewn back up again, and we start that process all over again. At any rate, my point is that a lot of people make it seem like they're parallel rituals. Oh, this one makes her a woman, and that one makes her a man. Well, that is true on one level, but what I'm saying is this one makes him a man by undergoing the pain and the physical marks on his body. He shows that he has the, the strength and the determination and all that kind of stuff that's going to make him the appropriate candidate for manhood. She, on the other hand, has her sexual functioning removed as a way to control her sexuality and to give her a husband. That's why she's marriageable, because she's not gonna cheat before marriage, right? Um, so it's a very different function, and the result, of course, is very, very different. Um, and, oh, by the way, and the infibulation and the recircumcision um, not only ensure her faithfulness to him, but provide him with extra sexual pleasure, right? Because she's sewn up. Um, so this is an example both from the Maasai, again, by the Maasai, they're treated as parallel rituals. Um, um, this is the male circumcision ritual is going to start here. You're not actually witnessing it there. Then there's the female circumcision ritual or the female uh, genital mutilation. Um, she, by the way, can cry um, and does cry uh, when she undergoes this because it is painful and her strength is not what's, what's at issue here. It's not her fitness as an adult. It's is she going to be a um, uh, faithful um, wife. Okay, we also go 
to practices like tattooing, which are also used in initiation rituals as well as throughout the course of typically an adult person's life in a lot of cultures. Now we're back to traditional cultures still. Um, again, a, a, a quote that I took from somebody at some point, I don't know where, men are instrumental, women are ornamental. So men do and women appear. Men accomplish and women are looked at. Um, so. These are both tattoos uh, of the Igoro. The Igoro are a um, Filipino uh, tribal group. Um, we've got facial tattoos as well as chest tattoos. They indicate his status as a warrior of the highest rank, and the chest tattoos indicate the number of men killed in battle. They were traditionally a headhunting tribe. And so the more and the more elaborate of these chest tattoos you had, it indicates how many men you killed and how many heads you brought home. The women, on the other hand, they make her more beautiful. And that's the focus of it. That's the goal of it. Um, there's simply nothing else. I mean, a little bit of it might have to do with family rank um, because you can afford a better quality tattooist and you can get prettier work, but it is to make her beautiful. There's no accomplishments there whatsoever. You know, the, the, the foot binding is just the classic, classic example of what I'm talking about here. Women's body modifications uh, don't just beautify them, they often make them vulnerable, submissive, and dependent, which themselves are attractive qualities for women, is to be submissive and to be dependent. So foot binding was practiced by the Chinese from uh, about a thousand years ago to about a hundred years ago, so it was about a thousand year practice. Um, it, pr it began among the elites, um, as a lot of practices do, it began, uh, began among the elites, maybe some prostitutes as well. So we begin now with little girls. These are not initiation rituals, so we begin with very young girls. You break the toes, fold them over, and then you wrap the bindings as tight as you can around the feet. Um, through the, as the girl gets older, you have to continually unwrap and tighten them back up again um, to, as she grows and as her feet, of course, grow bigger, but you're trying to make them as small as you possibly can. Um, the goal is to have what they call lotus feet, which would be these tiny little sort of stumps that fit into the shoes that are called lotus shoes that a woman makes herself. Um, the tinier the shoes, um, um, the more sex, you know, sexy she was and the more desirable she was and the more marriageable she was. Because what you're indicating is her family status, first off, because a working girl can't have her feet bound, right? If she has to work in the fields, she can't live like that because she mostly can't even walk. Um, so we're looking at upper status girls who can afford servants to carry their daughters around um, because they can't walk. Um, um, at any rate, so she's from an upper class family, a family that has raised her well. She's probably not also gonna be going out and cheating with the, um, you know, the stable boy, um, because again, she can't really walk. Um, so she's probably gonna be faithful um, to her husband. It's all of the indications that you really need to have the wife that you want, the wife who's gonna be submissive, the wife who's gonna be dependent, the wife who's gonna be vulnerable, um, all of which make her more beautiful. Um, you know, we think about the classic Cinderella tale. Um, the, that tale, the Grimm's Brothers tale uh, is a tale found in other cultures as well. It may have come from China. It's difficult to know exactly where it came from, but it may have come from China, which would be kind of perfect because if you remember, um, the mark of Cinderella and the mark of her beauty was the size of her feet, right? The prince was looking for the princess, for the, you know, she wasn't a princess yet, who had the smallest feet in the kingdom because the smallest feet in the kingdom meant she was the most beautiful woman in the kingdom. Now, in the, um, one of the original versions of the tale, even in the grim version of the tale, this was still the case. It certainly was not in the Disney version. But when the prince ends up at Cinderella's house, you know, the stepmother, who had big old feet because she was ugly, um, and her ugly daughters had big feet, well, she didn't let Cinderella come out and try on the shoe. She made both of her daughters try on the shoe. And originally, when the first daughter with her big ugly feet tried on the shoe, of course, it didn't fit. Yes. So she cut off her toes and jammed that bloody stump into the shoe. Well, remember, the slipper's made of glass. But he didn't, I think the prince wasn't that smart because he didn't notice it until he was already halfway out of town on the horse and her, there's blood spurting out of the foot. So anyway, so he brings her back and then they cut off the, um, the heel of the second daughter and then jam that into the thing. Same thing happens, it's bloody, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he finally gets the princess who has the beautiful, tiny, tiny feet. Now again, this idea though that 
small feet are indicative of not just beauty, but class and um, all the qualities that you want in the wife. It's found all around the world, um, even in the West. So we, of course, yes. Were those bound feet and their lotus foot, was that also your sexual gratification? <laughs> It's hard to know. Some people say that yes, that the men um, um, found fondling them and licking them. Now, you know they were pussy and stuff too, so um, it's difficult to really know if they really liked that or not, or if that's just what people say now. Um, but it seems to have played a part with prostitutes, you know, in terms of sexual activity. Now, but technically you went to bed, there was a special load of slipper that you wore in bed. So technically you weren't even supposed to have your feet ever open. Um, so I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, oh, so at any rate, of course, the stilettos or any other type of high heels that women wear today. Um, the reason that, you know, that high heels are so attractive on women and so demanded for, for women is, you know, by elevating the foot, of course, it makes the foot look smaller. That, of course, is the goal, one of the goals. It also changes the... Um, you know, the shape of the calf, it, um, you know, what people say is it makes it look like she's, um, you know, in the kind of a midst of an orgasm when your leg is stretched out like this. So that's one of the things that's attractive. But we can't deny that it makes your feet look smaller. And then that's one of the things. Now, because we have all these health problems, women do because of wearing these, not just high heels, but the very narrow toes, right? So we get the bunions and the neuromas and all the kinds of problems that women get. Um, they have to go to the doctor and deal with those problems. Well, there's also preventative surgical measures that you can now take. This is just a picture that illustrates some of those. You can get your feet narrowed. Um, uh, you can correct bunions. Sometimes before the deformities even occur, just go ahead and get your feet essentially shaved off on both sides so they'll fit into the more narrow shoes. Um, you can get Botox, Botox injections so that you don't sweat too much you know, because nobody likes a sweaty foot. Um, foot padding, you can put fillers underneath the pads of your feet to make it more comfortable. Um, and also because of the fact that those pads are gonna diminish over time as you get older. Um, you can slim your toes, you can just flat out get the pinky removed and you don't need it anyway it's kind of a wasted digit and that way you can fit into those much more narrow shoes you can get your toes straightened you can get your toes lengthened if you've got those terrible short toes you can get them shortened if you've got those terrible monkey long toes um, so there's all different ways that women can get their toes fixed up so that they look better um, Let's see. But again, you cannot deny that one of the things that's going on here as well, besides the fact that you're making your feet look smaller, is that it also makes a woman more vulnerable, right? Men wear shoes that are functional, that allow them to go out to work and walk and do the things that they have to do. Women wear shoes, you know, I don't wear real high shoes. I wear shoes like this. And even then, at the end of the day, lecturing all day, I feel like my feet are bloody stumps at the end of the day. I hobble into the house, and I take them off, and I have to drink, you know, to get over the pain. <laughs> so, um, and I'm just certainly not going to be, you know, if you used to watch Sex in the City when it was on, you would see Carrie Bradshaw running, you know, she'd be running after cabs in her unbelievable stilettos. Um, I think for most women that's not, you know, really a possibility. Even fashionable trends such as long fingernails or the wearing of high heels are geared to make women appear sexual and youthful even while they make her less useful. Because again, it's about ornamentality and not functionality or instrumentality. Okay, then we've got just you know, other ways in which women are beautified. A number of the beauty practices used by women today, such as cosmetic surgery, makeup, and dieting, are not only attempts to make a woman more beautiful, but ensure that her body conforms to other normative standards. So for a woman, I'm just going to grab some more water here. For a woman to be beautiful in the West today, she has to look perpetually young. She has to look artificially thin with artificially large boobs. Um, she can't be hairy, so the hair has to be removed. She can't be too tall, unless you're a supermodel, um, which is interesting because the women who are too tall make men feel emasculated, and yet the tallest of the tall women are used to model the clothes that are going to be worn by all the short, short fat women. Um, <laughs> They can't be too muscular either. I mean, that's been a controversy in bodybuilding, women's bodybuilding for years, is whether really muscular women um, 
can win the top prizes. You would think if the goal of bodybuilding is to become as muscular as you can be, you'd think that they should win the top prizes, but if they're too muscular, they're too masculine. And just like um, humans are worried about looking like animals or being seen like animals or crossing the human animal border, we're also worried about men and women crossing the gender border. That's a real problem. So women can't be too tall, too hairy, too muscular, too fat, too tattooed, or too much of anything. Their bodies must be disciplined and controlled. So now we go back again to this notion of state control. We may not have laws telling us what our bodies have to look like, but if you're a woman in our society, you are surrounded by every image and every norm and every ad um, that is encouraging you um, to look a certain way, and a way that's not very possible for most women to look. Because normative standards of beauty demand that a woman appear youthful and fertile, diet and exercise and cosmetic surgery are geared towards producing a body which appears childlike yet sexual. This is uh, always a fun image for me to show. It was one of the first images that became publicly known on those websites like Photoshop Disasters uh, because it's, uh, what's wrong with her body? I mean, her head is bigger than her waist is. Um, it's just not a human body. So, and look at her hips and, I mean, the whole thing is crazy. So at any rate, it's a Photoshop disaster is what, you know, we'd call it today. And yet these images continue to come out in, um, in advertising for both the high fashion designers and even things like, you know, JCPenney and Target, where the Photoshop people go a little over aggressive on making her look a little bit more like what um, the ideal female but form should look like. She, except for I don't know if Barbies have big shoulders like that. I'm not sure. But it is looking kind of Barbie-ish because she's still got the boobs. Um, Yeah, no, I do think that they have a little bit more hips. I do think they do. Um, but it's just an interesting thing because you see this in a magazine, and until you are alerted to the fact that it's not realistic, we kind of think it is realistic. Now, the, real, uh, the point I guess I'm trying to make is that it's an impossible to, and I could have put a real woman here. I could have put Angelina Jolie or somebody like that here. For most women, it's an impossibility to achieve an appearance like this for most women. Some women, of course, uh, you know, have these genetic, not hers again, nobody does, but you know, of a normal supermodel. Some women do look like that. That's why they're supermodels, but most women do not. The reason that supermodels are so highly valued is because what they have is very rare. And it's very rare, but we all want to have it. And so we're all chasing an ideal that is rare for a reason, and yet we all are measured by that ideal. And that means that most of us don't live up to that ideal, and so women are judged as failures in the only thing that, we really, that really matters for women, which is our physical appearance. It doesn't matter what you've accomplished in your lifetime because women are not judged by accomplishments. We're judged by appearance. The value of beauty depends in part on the high cost to achieve it. There are costs to achieve it. If you're not, again, genetically endowed, then the costs are going to be through cosmetic surgery, the costs are going to be through makeup, the costs are going to be through the gym, the costs are going to be through all of the money that's spent on the multi-billion dollar um, diet and exercise industry. Um, there are costs that make um, certain appearances out of um, reach for most of the population, in particular the poor and the working poor. So, Beauty then becomes a class issue. So it becomes, and it always has been, of course, if we go back again to the ancient Egyptians where the elites were only allowed to wear certain kinds of wigs. They were only allowed to wear the coal on their eyes. They were only allowed to wear certain kinds of shoes, of sandals, and other people were not allowed to, again, according to the sumptuary laws. So it's always been a part of our society, but it's becoming more so now because more um, of beauty is um, expensive today, and so it's hard to reach for everybody else. Um, so let's see. Um, the value of beauty depends in part on the high cost to achieve it. Beauty then is largely confined to the elite classes. Poor women with natural beauty can parlay that into success via marriage, modeling, or acting. And of course, that is what poor women who are beautiful do, um, is they get on America's Next Top Model, you know, or any of those kind of shows. Now, I just want to um, end with tattooed ladies. Um, there's something that I've always been fascinated by. These are women who 
um, made their living in the 19th and early part of the 20th century on being sideshow freaks because of the, uh, their full body tattoos. From the turn of the century until the 1940s, most major circuses and carnivals employed tattooed women and men as sideshow attractions. Let me say that before that practice started, the original practice was to bring back tattooed people from the um, third world you know, countries that had been colonized. And they were brought back as freaks to again be displayed in European and American um, taverns and dime museums. And eventually as the circus and carnival industry emerged, they were displayed that way. Um, that was going on from uh, the 17th to the 19th centuries. But eventually as um, European sailors uh, started to come into contact with tattooed people around the world, Polynesia in particular, um, they began to get tattoos there themselves. And then they would come back and in the very early days of this, a man who was tattooed with just a couple of tattoos in Tahiti or New Zealand or something like that could make a living by traveling around um, uh, in the carnival circuit. Um, eventually, that wasn't good enough anymore, and you had to have a full body tattoo. Well, eventually, a man with a full body tattoo himself wasn't good enough, so when women got into the action, that was it. Um, because you had women who were not just tattooed, but who could then tell a story about how that tattoo uh, came about, and that story is going to have to do with sex, always. Um, it's going to have to do with some sort of a native capture kind of a narrative, where she's captured by, um, you know, a headhunting um, chief who raped her repeatedly and forcibly tattooed her and then she comes back and makes um, a mint um, by going across the country and displaying herself and telling that story. Um, so these tattooed ladies were huge business. The tattooed lady was both performer and work of art, subject and object, in that her body was on permanent display to be stared at by hundreds of people every day, yet at the same time, she was also in control of that body with respect to its production and consumption. It is an interesting thing that these women, in a time when women did not have independent careers, um, could get themselves to a tattooist. And by the way, these the earliest women were tattooed uh, by hand before the tattoo machine was invented in the 1880s. So they were by hand, which I've never had it done before, but it was evidently very, very painful, very, very slow. Um, and so to get your whole body covered in this way as a young woman would have been extraordinary. The tattooed lady was both spectacular and a spectacle. Her body was viewed by society as out of bounds and out of, but uh, oh, I think that's extra. But nevertheless, she was a spectacle of her own making. So uh, to be a sideshow freak, um, the whole definition of a freak is that there's something spectacular about you that people want to gawk at. Um, there's made freaks, tattooed people, and there's born freaks, which are people with physical disabilities that were so extraordinary that you, you know, dwarfism, things like that, that you showed yourself, or, you know, Siamese twins, um, that you showed yourself. Um, but these people in particular were really in control of their destiny um, by making a choice to become a freak and then to, again, um, travel around. Now, sometimes they had agents who um, kind of controlled them, but many were really um, independent. Let's see, when we see men and women engaged in the same body modification practice, such as tattooing, it is still often done differently based on gender ideologies and assumptions. So here we get again the narrative, the savage native um, who captured, um, and by the way, that actually did happen now and again. There was a woman named Olive um, Oatman who was famously captured by uh, the Mojave Indians in California and forcibly tattooed, um, and eventually she was rescued, and then she went on the circuit, um, you know, telling stories about her captivity. But for the most part, they were made up stories. Um, but again, the f women were so much more popular because their myths also included a sexual element. They were not only taken captive, but possibly ravaged by their captors. You know, sometimes you can't just come out and say, especially back in the day, that you were raped, so you imply it through your storytelling. Tattooed ladies showed off their legs, their shoulders, and sometimes their breasts. Some also did a striptease. Some didn't. Some were, you know, made a point of not doing things like that. Um, but um, at the very least, you hitched up your skirt so that you could see a good part of your thighs. G. 
Jean Carroll, she's an interesting story. She was a bearded lady. In other words, she was a born freak. She had um, hirsutism, so she had, you know, a beard, a natural beard. So she originally was on the sideshow circuit through that, um, but she fell in love with a contortionist who would not marry her unless she got rid of her beard um, because he did not want to, you know, be sexual with her with, when she had a beard. Um, so she got rid of her beard. I don't know how she did it back then. Maybe she just shaved it every day. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but she wanted to stay in the business, and so that's when she got herself tattooed so that she could stay in the business and continue to be independent even after she married. So it's sort of an interesting uh, story in that she, her choices were constrained by this man, but yet she still you know, was able to take control of her destiny. She was working from, I think, about the 20s until the 50s. She was famous um, on Coney Island. Let's see, Irene LaBelle Woodward, she claimed to have been tattooed in Texas in order to ward off the sexual advantages of savage Indians. So this one's taking the sort of the savage captive story and turning it around and saying that she got herself tattooed so that she would be um, gruesome to the Indians and so that they would not want to take her. Nora Hildebrandt claimed to have been tattooed by her father under threat of death by Sitting Bull. So I guess you can imagine her and her father are captured by Sitting Bull and for some reason he says, you tattoo your daughter or I'm gonna kill you both. At any rate, she actually was tattooed by her father who was a tattooist, but um, there was no Sitting Bull involved. Now, you find with a lot of these women, again, I'm a little bit conflicted because on the one hand, they were independent women. They did make a living uh, off of their bodies by themselves, but a lot of them were tattooed by their husbands or by their fathers. Um, uh, Artoria Gibbons was tattooed by her husband. She originally was tattooed as one of the few ways a woman could make a living. So there was this level of independence, but also of having the husband tattoo her because again, it is sort of an intimate um, proposition. Betty Broadbent is probably the most famous tattooed lady of all. Of all. She worked until the 60s. Um, she did not give the whole native capture story. She didn't like it. Instead, she played up the fact that she was very refined. She liked birds and she liked art and she was a very ladylike lady. And that was part of her appeal was not, she didn't do the kind of the bump and grind. Um, she didn't talk about being raped, but um, she, her appeal was the fact that she was so ladylike and yet had what at the time still, all the way up through the 1960s were a very masculine, um, um, thing on her body because tattooing in this country was controlled by men, worn by men, um, given by men for up until the 1970s when it started to shift. This is Irene Liberi. This is long after her career was over. She said that when she was out on the street, she wore long sleeves and double stockings so people wouldn't know she was tattooed. She says, I just didn't like to make an exhibition of myself on the street, which I think is such an interesting point to say. She was an exhibition. That's how she made her money was as an exhibition. But she's also making the point that for a woman to have a body that's out of control in some ways, um, to have, you know, to be fat or to have too big of boobs or to have a bra strap that's showing or hairy legs or something like that, that's making a spectacle of yourself. That's making an exhibition of yourself. And she didn't want to do that. She wanted to be seen as a normal lady. Let's see. Um, so just a, a couple of questions about this. This is a quote from Mary Russo. She asks, in what sense can women really produce or make spectacles out of themselves? So again, I'm saying that these women are um, making spectacles out of themselves in order to be independent, but also, of course, they're putting themselves on display. They are contributing in some ways to their own objectification by putting their bodies on display. Um, so I think it's a lot of things for tattooed women today. For a lot of women, it's a political statement. For a lot of women, they say that their tattoos make them feel empowered, make them feel in control of themselves. A lot of women, in particular older women, get their first tattoo after a divorce or when some, they've had kind of a major um, change in life, they get a tattoo. Um, but you know, there's also no question that women are always on display. Women are always being looked at, and it's just another way in which women are looked at. 
This is Irene Liberi again. These are her legs. She said, I figured that if I lost my legs and lost the use of my body, uh, uh, as long as I had my hands and my eyes, I could always make a good living for myself. So again, very practical, um, very independent. This is um, Christine the Colorful, um, um, one of the more heavily tattooed women today, if not the most, I don't know if she's the most. Um, some women embrace tattooing as a confrontational practice. Heavily tattooed women's bodies in the West still represent an assault to conventional notions about the female body, yet many women use tattooing and piercing and scarification and branding and even more radical practices to not only challenge normative conventions about femininity, but to reclaim their own bodies as well. Um, oh, I already mentioned this. Many tattooed ladies were tattooed by their husbands. Their bodies were in some ways owned and marketed by them. Um, that's Stella Grassman and her husband. A practice that still continues today. This is most common in the biker community um, and also among some gang members, um, this property of on women's bodies. When women did start becoming tattooed in large numbers in the 1970s, tattoos changed in many ways to accommodate them. More feminine designs were developed, butterflies and dolphins and cats on um, flowers. Um, and tattoos were placed on more feminine parts of the body in order to allow the tattooed woman to retain her femininity or emphasize her sexuality. This, of course, is now known as the tramp stamp, um, the one that's done um, on the uh, top of the butt, um, and then you wear your jeans low enough so that your thong and your tattoo peek out. Then there's the question of weight. Uh, this is just a quote uh, from a tattooist, Peter Polos. He said, I'm not really into tattooing fat girls. It's a job to draw attention to a fat girl's giant boob or big ass. So if they really want one, I encourage them to get it on their wrist. So first off, he's saying, you know, there's something gross and already a spectacle, but not in a good way, about fat girls. And then if they really want to get one, just get it on your wrist. It's probably the smallest part of your body. Still a little bit feminine. Making a spectacle of oneself is a uniquely female danger. Women's bodies are already transgressive, making women's jobs to maintain respectability that much harder. To make a spectacle of oneself involves a loss of boundaries, fat thighs, visible bra strap, loud voice, heavy makeup. To be tattooed is to overstep one's boundaries. Um, if anybody in here has ever read any women's magazines, starting from 17, going all the way up to Red Book and uh, so many of the adult women's magazines, almost all of them have a feature in common. Um, in 17, it's called Trauma Rama. Um, um, they're called different things in the different magazines, but essentially it's a little part of the magazine that's devoted to shame, uh, to ways in which women embarrass themselves. You know what I'm talking about? I was at a party with my husband, and oh, I sat down, and it turns out that my you know, squirt was actually tucked into my panties, and I embarrassed myself. Oh, it was so terrible. Um, and that's what the columns are about, is about how women humiliate themselves, often through a bodily exposure. Um, I don't believe that men's magazines have that feature or have that common. It just doesn't seem like it. All women, according to Jane Gaines, learn to carry the mirror's eye within the mind because we know we are always on display, both from our own experiences of being constantly watched, but also from looking at images of other women in the media who, of course, are being watched. Um, you know, I think about when I used to go to tattoo conventions when I was doing my, um, my research um, years ago, and, you know, part of being at a tattoo convention means displaying your tattoos. Men and women do that because that's the point of being there. What is different between men and women though, is that for women and beautiful women, good looking women like this with shapely bodies, they are, I should have a picture like this, but I don't, they are surrounded by men who are photographing them. Um, they are surrounded by men who are photographing them, not just because they have beautiful tattoos, but because here's a kind of a naked woman who's walking around the convention floor. You know, you gotta, you gotta pic picture that. So tattooed women are doubly displayed at tattoo conventions and on tattoo magazine covers. It's very difficult to pick up a tattoo magazine these days without seeing a woman on the front. Now, 
a lot of the women who are on the front of tattoo magazines have beautiful tattoos, but a lot of them don't have a lot of tattoos. This one right here, sure she's got some tattoos, but we're mostly looking at her belly and her boobs. Um, we're looking at her boobs, her boobs, her boobs, um, her boobs. Um, at any rate, it's just very, very common that that is the, um, the function of the woman on the tattoo magazine cover is to, and by the way, these are not women. Other magazines that have a person on the cover, there's a cover story about this person right inside. These are not people who are inside the magazine. They're just the hot woman on the cover. Tattooed women today. Western women, uh, and especially middle class women, often define their body practices in terms of healing, empowerment, or control. The body is both the site for the inscription of power and the primary site of resistance to that power. Uh, the body entails the possibility of counter-inscription, of being self-marked. One can argue that women, through marking their bodies with unconventional body practices, are working to erase the oppressive marks of a patriarchal society and to replace them with marks of their own choosing. These women can be said to control and subvert the ever-present male gaze by forcing men and women to look at their bodies in a manner that keeps them in control. I don't know if you remember the scandal about Michelle McGee. She was the woman who was the one that uh, Jesse James was cheating on Sandra Bullock with. Now remember the narrative. Sandra Bullock is America's sweetheart. And I'm not saying she's not, but she's beautiful and she's classy and she's the, you know, the romantic comedy woman and all this kind of stuff. And then there's Michelle McGee, who everybody can look at her and say, whore. Um, she's heavily tattooed. She's got swastikas on her. She dresses, at least according to the photos that we've all seen, um, in Nazi, you know, paraphernalia. And she's sleeping with Jesse James when he's married to America's sweetheart. Um, she's got tattoos on her forehead too. Um, so she's as kind of in your face about it as she can possibly be. So she's to me a nice representation. Uh, tattooed women overstep the physical boundaries of their bodies by marking them, and they overstep the boundaries of femininity by embracing a formerly masculine sign. She overstepped every, every um, um, thing that she could possibly overstep in terms of her relationship with James and her very sort of public um, um, interviews and displays after it all came out. She didn't seem ashamed. I guess that's sort of what I'm saying, is that according to Trauma Rama and Red Book and Good Housekeeping um, and Glamour, um, at least be ashamed of yourself. She never was. So final questions. Can we say that tattoos empower women by allowing them the space to contest categories of sexuality, beauty, and class? Or are tattooed women just duping themselves, allowing themselves to be manipulated into believing that they are now, finally, in control of their own bodies, when in fact they are still every bit as influenced by dominant notions of femininity and beauty as non-tattooed women? Even as tattooed women are attempting to carve out alternative notions of femininity, do their tattooed bodies operate to reinforce from mainstream society existing notions of female and male, beautiful and ugly? And that's where I'm going to leave it. I guess maybe I'll put those questions to you. Does anybody have a response? Why did you get your tattoo? Um, um, when I was young, it felt like a rebellious thing to do. It felt like I was 18. Um, I quit college for a semester and went to work as a cocktail waitress, which I thought was a really rebellious thing to do. Um, I wanted to work in Reno in a casino, but I couldn't get myself there, so I just had to work in a bar next to a pizza place. Um, but at any rate, um, it was that kind of empowering thing, too. Um, you know, I had that whole thing. My first tattoo was a dragon, and my Chinese astrological sign is a dragon, and it was all about the power and all that. You know, now, I think they're beautiful, and so I just keep getting tattooed for that. But back then, I was very, I, I had a lot of what I think a lot of young women have, which is um, I'm going to do something that's different, that makes me special, that makes me individual. And of course, like a lot of women, it was a piece of flash, you know what I mean? It was a pre-designed thing off of a wall, which countless, countless people already have on their bodies, which is one of the ironies. We think it makes us individual, and you know what I mean? It's a very commodi you know, commercialized practice. Um, 
But it was, it was kind of a big part of me kind of growing up, it was. I got my nose pierced at the same time. <laughs> yep. Yep. What do you make of like, the, the, the aesthetic sort of like boundaries that tattoo artists impose? Uh -huh. Because I know a lot of artists will say this is a feminine tattoo, uh -huh, this is a masculine uh -huh. tattoo, yeah. or that like, ha like having full arm mm -hmm. things are generally not considered quote unquote feminine. Right, right. So there's more skin showing. Right, right. Asian. Yes. In fact, this arm used to be, when I first got it done back in the 90s, had all that. It had all the skin showing, and I later got it filled in. Um, the tattooist is in some ways, um, you know, like the doctor. He's the professional. There's, he's the authority figure. You look to him. He's often a man, too. Um, I do think that a lot of it is that, that you're sort of subject to, um, you put yourself into this person's control, and they do have the kind of the aesthetic, um, you know, say on what happens. So I think for a lot of women, it is that. Um, now, there's a reason, of course, that they do need to take some level of control. There's so many people when I was doing, you know, hanging around in tattoo shops, so many people would come in, you know, and pull out this piece of paper from their pocket with some crappy drawing that their boyfriend, could you do this on me? You know what I mean? So they got to exercise some control. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. I think that's part of also why women started becoming tattoo tattooists and developing such a big, you know, women tattooists are extremely successful not because so many women want to go to them, you know. I've never been tattooed by a woman, by the way. And are they growing in numbers? The number mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it used to be a rough, rough ride for them. Um, you know, back when you still had to apprentice. I mean, a lot of people still apprentice today, but when you really had to apprentice, nobody wanted to take a woman on, and they demeaned her, and you know, all the stuff. But now it's just totally different. You know. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.